Oh, hello. 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 Yes, I can see you. So uh, it's going to be a bit obvious already, but Steve, you, apart from the fact that you've frozen and turned into a load of garbled uh, mess, suggesting I might need to turn the video off, what are we talking about today? It's a bit of a different type of day. As you can see, I'm not at the university. I am working from home like most people in the world. So we're going to record a computer file. Sean is at home at his house. We're socially distancing. I'm at my house. I've got my camera out. I'm sitting in my dining room. Uh, and we're going to talk about working from home. One of the things that I've been doing over the last week is I've been using software like Microsoft Teams to communicate with my students and things. Everything now at the University of Nottingham is being done online. And I thought it'd be interesting to spend a few computer files talking about the technology that people are using to work from home. We'll do a, a series of videos on these sort of things while we're all locked down. And we'll explore some in sort of overview and others will go down into the details of some of the nitty gritty stuff. And I thought the first one to start with would be to look at what people are using to connect to their work networks, which is virtual private networks. So there's two uses of VPNs. There's a sort of use that people use at home, perhaps, and there's a sort of use that people use in the business world, where they're trying to connect to their corporate network so they can use resources that exist on that corporate network. And it's that latter view that we're going to talk about today. The technology used to do it both from when using it at home to sort of protect your traffic if you're on a hostile network, and when you're in the business world is the same, but the emphasis is slightly different. We're going to talk about it from the business world emphasis because of the current situations. I think the place to start is to think about how people use their computers and networks in a business and then we can extrapolate from that the problem that we need to solve with a virtual private network and then how the technology works from that. So I'm going to draw a little diagram. Um, I don't have any computer listing paper here but I have the next best thing. I have my iPad with computer listing paper on it and we'll draw on that and hopefully the screen capture will work and you'll be able to see what I'm doing. Let's have a think about what a typical corporate network would be. We would have some computers that people would use and these would sort of be networked together. Let's just have a couple. It would be a small office and they're all connected to a single network and alongside that there might be servers that you'd use. So there might be for example a file server which contains some secret information. We'll call this the files and we might have a database which has got some information on. And on a normal corporate network, you can access that quite easily. The machines can send packets out over the network to the file server and access it. And things are generally secure. You may have some permissions set up so only the right people can access the right services and so on. But these days, that network is going to be connected via some sort of router to the internet. And if I can draw a cloud picture, that will be the internet. And so those machines can also access the internet via the router and the router can act as a firewall so that people can't get into it from the outside. And that all works absolutely fine. The problem comes is if we have a person sitting out in a cafe or working from home who wants to access those same resources, we need to provide access to those resources without making them insecure. Now some of these you could secure and put directly out on the web, there's no problem doing that. But some of them may be devices that you don't want accessible out on the wide internet. What we want to be able to do is to have the person who's sitting here on the outside be able to access as if they were directly connected to that network. But of course, they're not in the physical premises, so we can't just run a cable to them. So how do we get around this? Well, what you could do at one point was you could buy a dedicated connection from your telecoms company and they would run a wire from your business premises to say the person's home and you could connect them directly. Really, you'd have a direct cable that ran across the whole thing. The other thing you could do is use a dial-up modem and the person would ring over the telephone network and connect to it that way. You'd have remote access via that. But that requires specific resources. It requires a dial-up modem, it requires a direct connection being put into place. What would be great is if someone could just sit on the internet and access those resources from wherever they are but with the same level as access as if they had a physical connection to the network. And this is what a virtual private network is trying to solve. Now, how does that work? Well, we need to think about how the computer is actually communicating over the local network, and then we can extrapolate out from that to see how the data gets sent over a virtual private network. 
So let me bring up a new sheet of virtual paper. This is an interesting experience doing a computer file this way. It's very different from doing it with Sean in the room. So let's think about it. We've got a machine on the local network and we've got a file server. So it's trying to access files through that. Now in the way that modern networks work, particularly IP networks, we take the data we're trying to send and we break it down into a series of chunks, which we call packets. And we send a series of chunks out over the network. But those chunks don't go as pure data over the network. We need to sort of wrap them up so that when they get to the other end, they can be sort of unwrapped and put back together in the right order. Because depending on how the network's configured, depending on how complicated the network is, they may get take different routes to get to the point. So there's various things. Generally, we'd have the data in a packet. And then on top of that, we'd put a series of headers that tell us things. So on a standard network these days, you'd have a TCP header there that would tell it the order that these packets need to go in. And then you'd have an IP header put in front of that, which would tell it where it's going, where it's come from. And then these days, the local network will almost certainly be Ethernet, and that whole lot will be put inside an Ethernet packet. And so we'll have an Ethernet header at the top. And then that can be sent either directly to the machine that wants it or to a machine that can pass it on to the machine that wants it over the company's local network. So that's how we send data over the local network. But we can actually do the same thing if we had a direct connection. Rather than having the machine put it directly on the local network, we'd have another machine which was connected to the local network and connected to the direct connection, and it would give an IP address to the remote machine. Remember, this is a physical direct connection, either via dial-up modem link or um, a physical uh, lease line from the telecoms company. And then it wouldn't put the Ethernet header on the front of that there. So the Ethernet header would disappear, but it would wrap it up in some other form of header. So the usual one that was used on lease lines was a PPP, a point-to-point -point protocol packet header. Same thing, we take the data, wrap it up in a TCP header, wrap it up into an IP header, and then send it out using PPP over the direct connection between the two machines. So that's how we could do it there. But what if we want to do this with someone who's just sitting on the internet? Well, we can do basically a very similar thing. We give the remote machine an IP address as if it was on our network, but rather than it sending that packet directly to the machines over the internet, what it does is it takes that wrapped up IP packet and it wraps the whole lot up as another packet. So it has a UDP header here. That's another way things communicate over the internet. And there's a reason why it uses UDP over TCP, which we might cover in a later video. And then that gets wrapped up as another IP packet. But this time, rather than saying where it's going to go on the local network, this is going from the remote machine's address on the internet to a gateway server on the, that's running at the company. So that then gets sent um, over the internet to the right machine, to the gateway server. And then the header can be removed, the UDP header, to leave the original IP packet that was sent by the machine and the same thing can happen in reverse. But there's a couple of issues. One, we're sending data out over the internet, so we need to make sure that that data is protected from being altered as someone is sending it, and also that someone can't read the secret information that might be in that data. And we can do that using cryptography. We can use hashing to hash the data that's in there and then say whether it's been changed or not, because we can sign that hash in the same way that Mike's talked about in other videos. And we can also use cryptography to encrypt the data so that it can't be snooped on as it travels over the internet. So that's relatively straightforward. That gives us the private part and we get the virtual part because we're sending it over the internet over a virtual link that we've created just using a standard internet connection. You have to set up your corporate network so that it knows that I, the packets going to this particular IP address need to go out over a virtual private network link and so we can send it out over there and also you need to make sure that the machine the remote machine is sending packets that are going to that machine over the virtual network and so on there's actually two ways you can get the remote machine to send packets you can either um, just send the ones that are going to that network there and let everything else go out over the internet and that works fine um, you get good browsing speed but you might also be using services on the internet that you don't want people to know about if you're working on um, you might be accessing resources that could compromise your business integrity and so on. 
And so you can also set it up, and this is what people use at home if they're using a VPN to protect their connection, so that all your traffic is sent over the virtual private network, and then it appears as if it's leaving from the business network where it's coming out of with their IP addresses, even though actually the machine is in a different location. And so the data is uh, encrypted and sent over that to the destination and then sent on from there as if you were connected to that network. And so it's not proxied, it's as literally as if your machine is connected to that network. Of course, the problem you have here is if you're sending all your data out over the virtual private network, you need to make sure that the virtual private network data traffic itself isn't sent out over the virtual private network, otherwise it wouldn't get there. And the operating system can usually take care of this because the connection to the virtual private network is created before you start sending data over the virtual private network so it can still track where it needs to route that information over the internet. The only other thing you need is some way to authenticate who the person using the network is and this is usually done when you start up the connection so whereas with a normal network connection these days if you connect to Wi-Fi, you connect to Ethernet, you're immediately connected to the network. There may be some access controls there to um, say whether you can actually use it and send things anywhere but the technology immediately connects you. With a virtual private network, you have to set that connection up. You need to set up that virtual connection with the server at the company end and the uh, client at the remote end as configuring the details so that they know where the IP address is, where to send those wrapped up packets back over the network. I understand what's being achieved there, but does this run into any problems at all? Obviously, it's blockable. You could see the VPN traffic going over and you can just sort of stop those packets being sent and so on. Um, you shouldn't, if the encryption's good, and actually setting up all the encryption and making it right is quite difficult. And there's a lot of sort of commercial home use VPNs where actually, if you're not careful, it can be set up so it's virtually not encrypted at all. The other thing to say from that point of view is that it's still possible to see what people are doing even if they can't see actually the data they're transferring. I mean, certain activities that you might do over the internet have specific patterns that data is transferred in. And so you can infer from the way the packets over the VPN are going, what's actually happening there. So it's not a true hidden thing. You could still see some things, for example, the difference between a, a sort of video conferencing call like this and a web page. You'd be able to say, hmm, looks like they're video conferencing, or hmm, looks like they're sort of web page. You wouldn't have full detail, but you could sort of infer that from the way the traffic is sort of being transferred and things. The other thing is, of course, from a more practical point of view, it will add latency to your connection because you've got to send the packet to the VPN server and then out to its destination. Um, it'll add latency depending on how bad the network is where you are. That might actually be faster because if your business has got a faster connection, that might be a more direct route than you going directly if you follow. Um, and of course, because each packet has to be slightly smaller to fit the extra headers in there, then you will run slightly slower than the maximum speed you could transfer, but that's marginally less. So there are swings and roundabouts. Direct connection and so on is always going to be faster, but this gives you a lot of peace of mind. It means you can have access as if you were sitting on your corporate network. If this is our data path with our columns, by sharing bytes around the different columns, when we combine it with the mixed column step, which we'll do in a minute, you'll see that actually we're mixing everything up. So within just a couple of rounds, we could either make the computer processor faster or we can have multiple cores, each working on part of the problem at the same speed. 